Let us look at some realistic examples of process landscape models. Here you see the example of the process landscape of Wiener Linien, that's the operator of public transport in Vienna. This landscape model takes a rather fine granular approach, distinguishing several core processes. You see in the middle that there is a core process of manage customer relationship. It is about contacting customers, managing sales and fostering relationship. There's another process of operating vehicles. It is about planning and buying vehicles, maintaining them and checking them. There's a process of transporting customers. This is about planning customer transportation, actually conducting transports and evaluating these transports. And finally, there's a core process of providing the infrastructure for this. That is planning the infrastructure, building it, maintaining it and evaluating it. All these are different core processes that are intertwined when customers are actually transported. Various support processes are required to make the core processes work. These support processes are about managing personnel, managing financials, managing information, managing materials, managing disruptions and providing winter service. There are several management processes that steer the overall direction of the company. These are about managing the enterprise, communicating inwards and outwards, managing processes, managing quality, managing risks and opportunities and managing innovation. Let us compare this with a second example. Here you see the so-called process map, that is the process landscape model of SAP. SAP is a major software vendor of enterprise software. They take a very abstract perspective on their processes. SAP distinguishes management, core and support processes and they formulate only one core process. That process is composed of three sequential steps. Innovate, sell and deliver enterprise software. There are several support processes. Attracting, developing and retaining workforce. Providing workplace and infrastructure. Procurement. Corporate financial and operational compliance. Shareholder and stakeholder management. There are two major management processes. Define, operate and track strategy. Sales, franchise and partner management. Not only the sequential, decompositional and specialization relationships between processes have to be understood. Process profiles describe aspects that are important for a process in more detail, but still in a very abstract manner. You see here an example of a procure to pay process of the Build It company that we use at several stages of the book as an example. The process profile describes the procure to pay process and its various characteristics. The process is associated with a vision. Here it is the objective of the procurement process to secure that the entire range of external products and services become available on time and at the required level of quality. A process owner is defined, here the financial officer. There are customers of the process defined and expectations of these customers. It is, a, it is a requesting unit that expects a timely, economic and complete provision. There is a desired outcome. The delivered products or provided services of the request unit are available. The process is triggered by a need identified. 
A sequence of important activities can be listed here, from submitting the request to its creating the purchase order. Technical interfaces are described inbound and outbound, and there are required resources listed, such as human resources, informational resources, or infrastructural resources. The process also relates to process performance measures. Here in this case, this is cycle time, operational cost, and error rate. How can we define a process landscape model in detail? Several steps have to be conducted. The first step is about clarifying the terminology. This seems trivial, but it is a very important step because it may be the case that terminology is not standardized in a company. If that is not the case, the key terms have to be defined. Often it is also useful to build up an organizational glossary. Terms can be also lended from reference models, such as the APQC framework as we have seen it. It is important that all stakeholders can consistently understand the process landscape model and therefore terminology has to be clear. As a second step, we have to identify the end-to-end -end processes. These are the processes that interface with customers and suppliers. They also relate to the goods and services that the organization provides. Some properties help to distinguish these processes, such as product types, service types, different channels, or also different types of customers. For each of the identified end-to-end -end processes, we identify its sequential sub-processes and the different steps. To this end, we need to identify the internal intermediate outcomes of the end-to-end -end process. Some perspectives are helpful here, understanding, for example, the product life cycle or the customer relationships, the supply chain, the transactional stages, or the changes of business objects that separate these different steps. Fourth, for each business process, we need to identify the major management and support processes. We ask what is required to execute the previously identified processes. There are some typical support processes that you find in many companies related to the management of personnel, financials, information and material. However, it needs to be understood that these processes can also be core processes depending on what is the business model of the company. For instance, if you think of a company that rents out staff members to other companies, then managing personnel could be a core process. It is a bit easier with management processes. These are usually generic. Step number five, we need to understand if we need to decompose or specialize the business processes. This essentially relates to transitioning from the process landscape on level one to the less abstract representation on level two. Such a subdivision is continuously applied until we reach a level where we have a process that is autonomously managed by a single process owner. When do we need to stop with subdivision? Well, this very much depends on manageability and impact. There's no clear-cut rule, but it is a good practice to not go too detailedly. For example, we mentioned SAP, they centrally manage their process architecture from level one to level three. For each of the identified processes, we have to compile a process profile. 
This process profile describes the characteristics of these processes in more detail. Finally, we check for completeness and consistency. Here reference models can be of good help.